spray I'm going to use today is scribed by Maureen Edwards and can be found as part of the opening worship in the disability and impairment module of the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Toolkit. If you've not seen that toolkit, um, it's on the Methodist Church website. It's a really uh, good read, really helpful resources within it. Let's turn to God as we pray together. Let's pray. God of love, increase in us an awareness of the spirit who leads us forward across new boundaries to discover Christ in all whom we encounter. Make us sensitive to the spirit of honest inquiry. Amen. So as we begin today, I'm delighted to give a special welcome to three individuals who've helped us plan and will be helping us deliver today's webinar. I introduce first Pam. Pam is a supernumerary presbyter who retired on ill health due to chronic illness. We'll be uh, watching Pam's video later uh, in the webinar. Uh, I want to invite Wayne. Wayne is a pastor of three Methodist churches in the Rotherham and Dern Valley circuit, married with two grown up children and granddad of two gorgeous little girls. He might be slightly biased, but I'm sure it's true. And finally, Mo. Mo is a student presbyter. She's an advisor at the University of York, leading project work for disabled students and also co-chair of the Disabled Staff Network. Over the past 25 years, she's had lots of experience in delivering disability awareness training and representing the views of disabled people locally and nationally. Mo also happens to be a wheelchair user and the carer for her disabled son. So now I hand over to Mo, who will explore with us what disability is and what helpful language we might or should be using. Mo, over to you. Thank you. It's really good to um, have been invited to come along and share with you today. I have got a PowerPoint um, and I have got some notes. So if you see me looking away from the camera, I'm looking at my notes. I'm not ignoring everybody. Um, I have got some slides with us um, and those are going to be operated for me. So I get to say next slide, please, like they do on the government briefings. Um, so we'll start with our first slide, please. I'm going to start by talking about what disability is. There are two basic models of disability. There's a medical model, which is very much a deficit model. So that's around um, a person being disabled by a particular condition they have or a set of particular symptoms that they have. So it's the condition that causes disability. And that condition or behaviour under this model needs to be corrected in order for the person to engage with society. So under this model, we've seen lots of leg braces and crutches, not to support a person particularly, but to enable them to engage with society. That's just one example. Then there's the social model, which has been around for around 30 years now. I think it might even be a little bit longer. Under this model, a person is disabled by social barriers. So by features of the built environment or by people not including them in particular activities. And under this model, society is responsible for including everyone. So for people to be included, it's attitudes and environment that need to change rather than the behaviour or the condition of a person. So that's just a basic introduction. There's still very much a mixture of these two approaches um, that we come across day to day. The preferred one is generally the social model, but you will notice that um, the law sometimes means that we have to focus on the deficit model, so what people can't do because of their condition. And if you've ever supported anyone or applied for disability benefit yourself, you'll know that that type of process focuses on the deficit model, the things that you can't do and the significant symptoms. 
but I prefer the social model. So we'll move on to uh, the next slide, please. I thought I'd share the definition of disability as it is in the Equality Act 2010. So it's been around a while now. Um, it's a physical or mental impairment which has a substantial and long-term adverse effect on the ability to carry out day-to-day -day tasks. So you'll notice this is around the impairment having uh, causing difficulties. Disability under this definition is also a long-term condition that has lasted 12 months or is likely to last 12 months or more. So some people are included in this definition from the point of diagnosis and some aren't. There are some very specific conditions that are automatically included from the point of diagnosis. So cancer, HIV and multiple sclerosis are all included from the point of diagnosis. And by the time those conditions are diagnosed, it's likely that some symptoms will have appeared and caused issues. There are other conditions that it may not be so clear as to when they should be included under this definition. Variable conditions um, can be included from when they first have a substantial effect and then they continue to be included through periods of remission if the condition is likely to reoccur or the substantial effects are likely to reoccur. And they're also included with or without medication. The possible examples of this type of condition could be depression or diabetes or epilepsy. There are many more, of course. Progressive conditions such as arthritis are included from when they have a, a substantial effect at first as well. And that definition still includes those who've had surgery. So for example, joint replacement surgery and are getting around okay again, that's still included under the definition of disability. So those people included under the definition would be protected in employment, for example, and accessing um, different uh, activities and places um, to go to, including places of worship. Um, so it's something just to, to bear in mind, really. Disfigurement can also be included as a disability. Under the regulations, the word is severe disfigurement, um, but it, it's not clear what severe is. So um, disfigurement can also be included, and it may depend on what the activity is as to whether it has a substantial effect or not. Um, so that's just a whistle-stop tour of what the definition of disability is. There are many schedules under the Equality Act that describe a little bit more detail about how um, that's to be put into practice. But I don't think that's for us to worry about today because this is just a brief introduction and some hopefully helpful tips on, on um, being around and talking to and about disabled people. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, there are several types of disability. There are so many impairments. I'm not going to sit here and list them all out because I don't think that's going to help. So some people will call a, a particular condition an impairment or a disability. And it's not necessarily important when we're referring to that in a broad way. So if we're talking about disability in a very broad way, the language around that doesn't feel too important. But when we're talking about individual impairments or individual people, it can start to become important. So I've put just some um, types or sort of groups of, of disability on here. These are in the EDI toolkit as well, although I think I've added a couple and I've phrased some of them in a slightly different way because the language is always changing around disability. Um, so it's not always easy to get it right because the language is always changing and I certainly don't get it right all the time. So there are sensory impairments, so under that category would be deaf people with a big D or deaf people with a small D. Um, and those people who are deaf with a big D often see being deaf not as a disability or impairment, but as a cultural thing. 
So actually being a British Sign Language user brings with it um, a particular culture. Some people may be hard of hearing, visually impaired or blind. There's a range of terms that we use around those impairments. There's mobility uh, or dexterity issues. So I've put here, for example, arthritis. So things that affect um, being able to reach for things, hold things um, and get around. Um, people under this category could be wheelchair users. We try not to say confined to a wheelchair or wheelchair bound um, because our wheels are our freedom usually. So it's just around people who might use a wheelchair, might use crutches or other mobility aids to get around. Um, neurological conditions such as epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, maybe someone who's had a brain injury. Um, and that term is quite broad as well. So a lot of people with neurological conditions might actually have a whole range of other issues going on and, um, you know, wouldn't be fitted neatly into a particular group of, of how disability affects them. There's learning disability. So talking about learning disability means perhaps someone with global development delay Down syndrome, or someone who has significant cognitive difficulties or difficulties with learning everyday tasks, um, as well as learning in, in education. So there's mental ill health. We all have mental health and we all want to maintain our mental health. So when we talk about people who have mental health difficulties, we're talking about mental ill health, such as depression or anxiety, and some other severe and enduring conditions. Um, such as schizophrenia as well, and emotionally unstable personality disorder. There are so many, I'm not going to sit and list them. Um, and long-term health conditions as well, or chronic illness. A lot of people with long-term health conditions who maybe have effects that span a lot of these categories tend to refer to themselves as having a, chronically, a chronic illness or being con chronically ill. Um, but long-term health conditions can cover diabetes, it can cover cancer, there's a whole range of things there. Neurodivergent conditions, sometimes called neurodiverse conditions, um, autism spectrum conditions, note the use of condition rather than disorder, um, is, we're tending to move now towards that. Um, again, that's leaning a little bit more towards the social model of disability. ADHD might come under the neurodivergent conditions as well. And also specific learning difficulty or specific learning difference is also a type of disability or impairment that would be covered by the Equality Act. Things like dyslexia, dyspraxia and other things that affect people's learning in the classroom and also affect accessing the environment um, around and about. Not every condition fits neatly into one of these boxes. So it can be unhelpful to talk about a specific person as fitting into one of these groups of um, disabilities. However, it is helpful to think about access in these terms. So when you're thinking about access for people, can people with a sensory impairment access this activity is quite useful. So we'll move on to the next slide and just a few more hints about language. It is complicated. I thought I'd put that there. These slides are very boring, by the way, but they're screen readable. So um, that does mean they're slightly more accessible, hopefully, um, after this as well. Language is complicated. As I said, it is changing all the time. Um, I've mentioned some of the hints around language already. But one of the main things is people don't know how to refer to disabled people. Under the social model, the term disabled or disabled person is quite respectful and positive because what it does is it affirms that it's the environment that disables us rather than our conditions. But some people do prefer person first language, such as person with a disability. And if we're talking about people with the the types of, of or groups of impairments that have particular effects, such as people with a sensory disability, we're going with the person first language for a lot of that. Um, although you might find that people um, tend to pick and choose. So it's worth just listening to what a person actually says about themselves, how they frame that, 
um, you know, most of us like to be known by our names, but if you're talking about our conditions, then, um, you know, listen to the language that we use around that, really. Um, and as I said before, we can't get it right all the time. Language is always changing. There are some things that we say that might be offensive. Um, so it is worth being careful with our language. So it's tended to be, be um, pointed out more often recently that words like mental or insane, where we wouldn't use those words to refer to someone experiencing mental ill health anymore, people have started to use it in general language to describe a particularly busy environment or difficult situation. And that can often be quite unhelpful because people who have been called those things as an insult are now hearing it in everyday language. So it's just thinking a little bit before we open our mouths, which I know I struggle with. So, um, <laughs> you know, I think we can't get it right all the time, but please just um, the best thing to do is to take feedback about language graciously. So that's that's the end of that first little bit. Um, and I said that I would share something of my story as well. Um, I don't know if um, you want me to carry on straight into that, Carla. That'd be lovely, Mo. Yes, please. OK, I'm sorry that you're hearing. Oh, sorry. Sorry, there'll be opportunity for questions uh, and uh, later in our programme. So, Mo, yes, we'd love to hear your story. And there's nothing to apologise for. We're, we're delighted <laughs> that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, as I say, I was saying, you will hear a lot of me today. So um, I was going to share something of my own story. I have a lifelong joint condition called hypermobile Ehlers Danlos syndrome, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, and it's one of a group of conditions called hypermobility syndromes, which means basically our joints move too much. It's essentially caused by faulty collagen. And in most people, our joints are held firmly in place by ligaments and our muscles help support the ligaments to hold our joints together. And as we get older, our joints tend to get stiffer naturally. Um, but in a hypermobility syndrome, what often happens is our ligaments stretch too much. And so our muscles have to play a much bigger part in holding our joints together. And I often say that my ligaments are a bit like well-chewed gum because they've become much more stretchy over time. So as I've got older, my joints have got looser and they've started to dislocate a lot more easily, making everyday tasks a lot more painful. So um, I've got braces for just about every part of my body. I think the funniest one is the middle finger brace from when my middle finger dislocated and stuck up, which was rather inconvenient, especially for a preacher. Um, and, you know, I've, I've struggled a lot with painful joints throughout my life, but it also affects my insides. So my insides are a bit stretchy as well. So um, I won't go into details, but I've had a lot of gastrointestinal issues um, and regular chest infections and things as I've been um, growing up. Um, and I still get those now. So I haven't always known that I've got EDS and I used to fall over a lot as a kid. And my mum was a social worker and she used to dread taking me into A&E when I'd fallen over and hurt myself again and bruised really easily. Um, it was when I was about eight that um, a GP noted that my knees were unstable, but proceeded to tell my parents that the pain was all in my head. So I should just get on with everything as normal and uh, I would be fine. But that was really the start of about 28 years of trying to get a diagnosis, um, during which time I had loads of gait assessments, shoe inserts, adaptations, various mobility aids, knee surgeries. I moved jobs to one that was less physically demanding. I had to use a wheelchair for long distances as I got into my 20s. And yeah, during that time, I also got married and had a baby. But I'll tell you a little bit more about my son a bit later on, um, as he's also given me permission to share something of his story. So in 2002, I began training as a local preacher and was basically pretending to be fine when I was in the pulpit, although there were some pulpits I didn't use because I knew I'd just fall down the steps if I accidentally uh, got my footing wrong. So 
I don't know why I carried on doing that, trying to pretend to be fine. I even had to ask for an extra chair for my leg at my first interview because I'd just come out of knee surgery. Um, there was only one occasion, I think, where I dislocated my knee um, at the end of a service. I just finished giving the blessing, stepped down and then ended up in a heap on the floor and had to go to hospital. Um, which fortunately was a parade service. So there were all these people around me and it disguised it really well. <laughs> Almost got away with it. Fortunately, I was at my home church when it happened. And I've always been involved in like disability awareness sessions and things since I was about 15 and then more formally when I started working for the council at York. Um, and I also represented fellow disabled employees um, when they needed support as well. So it's a bit strange that I didn't want to be fully myself in church, even though I was open and talking about my disability everywhere else. Um, it was only when I decided that I was going to um, have to use a wheelchair all the time, and I was going to have to sit down to preach, that I decided I would have to like come clean and tell people about this in church. Um, and when I did, it was... Well, slightly bizarre, really, because not only did I get quite a positive reaction from those in the congregation, and they came forward with their own stories to me as well, that they had felt afraid to tell. I also got called um, to candidate for ministry at that point, um, which I wasn't expecting. I thought God had let me off the hook, but no, that wasn't the case. It was now time to go further forward with this. So, um, yeah, it has been a bit weird. People do act strangely sometimes when I rock up in a, in a wheelchair um, as the preacher. And some people have tried to offer me healing at the end of a service instead of a handshake. Um, so it has been interesting to negotiate those sorts of things. Um, but I'm also carer to my, my son who has a learning disability. He also has um, cerebral palsy. And so when we're out together, people tend to assume that he's the able-bodied one and he's fine because he's quite tall and he looks, he doesn't look disabled. But he actually, um, when he was born, he wasn't breathing and he had to be resuscitated and have a lot of treatments. And he was having seizures um, as a newborn. So he was diagnosed with CP at eight weeks old. And the doctor said to us, you know, he's going to be a wobbly walker if he does walk at all, Miss Sonia. And I said, OK, that's fine. I mean, my husband just looked at each other and went, yeah, that's fine. I said, at least I'll be able to keep up with him. And the poor doctor was like, well, Mrs. Sonia, have you understood what I've just said? I've just told you that your son has a permanent disability. And I sort of laughed and I had to then explain, well, I can't walk around a lot. And my dad's a wheelchair user as well. So He's not the first disabled person in our family, um, which, um, you know, meant probably that I was perhaps a bit less protective of him and let him do all sorts of things um, as he was growing up. He's now a T38 sprinter, so he definitely likes proving doctors wrong and he um, gets involved in all sorts of sports. He has a learning disability which only really became clear kind of as he was getting towards um, GCSEs because I think teachers had been keen because he looks fine to not understand how significantly that affects him. But now that's recognised, he's become a lot more confident and he's able to do things. So much so that he's decided, um, well, he decided earlier this year to go for the One Opportunity internship and he's doing that at our local church um, and he also wants to become a church member because he's really grown in faith over the past few years as I've been going through candidating and then beginning my training, um, which is lovely because we weren't sure that he would, would ever be able to understand that. So we're really pleased about that. Um, he does have serious anxiety relating to people not understanding that, that he's disabled. Um, but I think now he's starting to come out of his shell a bit now that he knows he's got support from other people. Um, I won't go on. I could do. Um, but just I did have a picture of us both because it's hard when you're sat here. 
you're just seeing the top part of me. So you're not seeing what we look like. So that's me in one of my many power chairs. I've got different ones for different situations. Um, and that's Dan just before he went to an awards night at the rugby league final because he plays for York City Knights learning disability team and they were having an awards night. So he bagged us some free tickets to the final. So uh, go Sporting Sun and keep doing things like that. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for, for showing that. I'm going to stop there because I think you've heard plenty from me. Thank you so much, Mo. It's just wonderful to hear your story, but also to see that fabulous picture of you and Dan. Um, and we thank you for um, sharing your wisdom at the beginning as well around um, disability. So we're going to go on into breakout rooms for a few minutes now. They're small breakout rooms, just three or four people. So please do take the opportunity just to say hello to each other and who you are. Um, and then we'd just like you to um, think about what resonated um, from Mo's story. Anything resonate for you? And then if you could also bring back any questions that you might have. Um, and um, we might have to hold some of those for the end, but we hope that we'll be able to pick up some questions as we go through. So my name's Graham, Graham Jones. I'm a colleague of Carla's and Rachel's in the learning network in this region. Um, we hope you had uh, a good time in your groups. Uh, short it was, but hopefully sweet. Um, so what we'd like to invite you to do now, um, just briefly, is to lodge any questions you might have or comments or anything that resonated with you. If you could put that in chat, that would be really helpful. Um, and uh, if that's not, if you'd if you'd find it easier to unmute yourself and voice your question or comment, then please feel free to do that. But uh, otherwise, if you're happy to put any questions or comments in chat, um, we will seek to address them uh, and respond to them uh, towards the end of the webinar. And if, if that proves impossible um, due to time pressure or, or whatever, then we will uh, uh, hope to respond to those questions uh, via email after the webinar. So um, if I can just invite you to put those questions and comments uh, into chat, and we'll just have a couple of moments while we're doing that. Um, but as I say, if you'd, if you'd rather unmute yourself and voice your question, someone, uh, well, not someone, Rachel, will uh, we'll, uh, note down that question if that's an easier way of doing that. So obviously you can continue to do that um, throughout the webinar, putting your questions into chat. Um, and at the, as I say, towards the end of the session, uh, we will seek to respond to those. Um, Okay, so please please continue uh, to do that and to feel free to put your questions and responses into chat. But we're going to move on and we're going to hear um, a little bit of Pam's story and some uh, a short Q and A session that she did with our colleague Siggy. And uh, this is a recorded uh, part of the program. Hello, my name's Pam Webster. I'm a supernumerary minister in uh, the Derbyshire Northeast Circuit. Until 2005, I led an active life. I was busy working as a circuit minister and for leisure was always going somewhere or doing something, cycling, climbing hills, walking for miles, and mostly talking for England. Then my life changed. There were already some hints that not all was right with my body. Eventually, I got a diagnosis of a rare chronic inflammatory condition like Sjogren's syndrome. It affects my eyes, my skin, my joints, my swallowing and digestion, my balance and my lungs. Meaning recently that I just get recurrent chest infections. Basically, anywhere in your body that should have lubrication in mine doesn't or not very much. And that affects far more than you would think. It has become more and more debilitating as time has gone on. 
and I find myself frustratingly limited in what I can do. As lockdown begins to ease and activities move back towards physical places rather than online, I wanted to share some of the obstacles that I find in church life in the hope that they might start some conversations or give some pointers to the kind of questions you might want to ask someone to see if you can make their physical experience of church better for them. It is important to say that my problems are not unique and they are not all the problems that are possible. I'm using my example to give an idea of some of the problems that people can face. The problem with a lot of disabilities is that disabilities are not necessarily visible and you wouldn't know that someone is dealing with them or that they needed help. None of what I'm going to say are criticisms, they're questions, pointers to make us think about our church buildings. I'm also acutely aware that my accessibility may mean someone else's inaccessibility. Someone, something that is there to help me may be making someone else's needs impossible to me. And for that reason, the conversation needs to go on. The first question we asked when we moved to this circuit two and a half years ago was which church has the comfiest seats? That might seem a really trivial question, but to me it is vital. And without without which physical church in a building would not be possible. I'm incredibly grateful to have a blue badge, but that's no help to me if there was no if there's nowhere near enough the building to park or someone without a blue badge has parked in it. What about the entrance into the building? Is it level? You would be amazed how big an obstacle a raised door frame at the bottom is. When you're wobbly, in a wheelchair, even with a pushchair or just got your hands full, that's a, an obstacle. Is the door too heavy? Can someone open it by themselves? Is there someone to open it for anyone who needs it? Remembering, of course, that it might not be obvious who would need help. When I get in the building, can I find an appropriate seat? I really need to sit with my right leg in the aisle, preferably with a large space between rows. Pews are quite simply an impossibility. I wonder if someone would let me have the seat that I need, if I was brave enough to ask. Or would I be accused of taking my seat? We've all been there. Can I sit at the back or the front if necessary for my disability? Is the seat comfortable? Is it high enough? Can I shuffle and change my position in it to move the pressure points? A lot of people with disabilities are very energy limited and cannot arrive in church half an hour early to get the seat they need. Or it takes a very long time to get going in the morning and to be up and out of the door. They may need to arrive at the very last minute and need to be able to have the right space. What is the lighting like? I really struggle with lighting. Is it too bright or not bright enough? Everybody's needs are different. Is there a, the possibility for some individually controlled lights? It also applies to screens. Are they in the right place? Are they legible? Are they too bright, too dark? Or using the correct colour contrasts? Different colour contrasts work better or worse for different people, so it can be tricky. I'm fortunate that I've been given my own individual screen at our church so I can set it up for the setting I need. Is that a possibility in your church? Likewise, if videos are used in worship, can they be seen and heard by all? Is there some way their point can be explained? 
I love a video in worship, but can rarely process them in that kind of space. And perhaps my one biggest plea is to make sure that your fancy graphics are actually readable. I've seen so many slides and social media points, posts from church and indeed from the connection in beautifully attractive colours that I can't read the information on. Just because it looks fancy and cool, unfortunately, does not mean that people can read it. Are there paper copies of words in large and appropriately uh, line spaced text? Can someone manage to carry or hold during the service anything that you are asking them to? Normal hymn books are really hard to hold and turn pages if your fingers or your wrists are not good. In breakout groups, can everyone understand what you want them to do? Is everyone able to participate? Can everyone hear, process and respond in that environment? Can there be an alternative option? I think we also need to be really careful about how we use language. One example is, do we invite everyone to stand to sing when not, when not everyone can stand or sing? Do we use phrases like, everyone can do this? Can they? Is our service very singing focused? My illness means I can't sing. I appreciate what a great tool in worship singing is and one I always used a lot. But if someone can't sing, are they excluded from worship in a big way? Do we speak at a speed that people can hear and process? It takes me a long time to hear what you have said, process it in my mind and then respond. This applies even to things like the Lord's Prayer, which I have to dredge from my mind and process through my brain before I can say it, which is much slower than most. I'm usually a couple of lines behind and give up. I stand no chance in remembering a response to a phrase in a prayer that you might ask me to share in. And how does celebrating communion together work? Is there a way to be a part of the body if we can't kneel together at the rail or even stand at the rail safely? Have we found a practical way around that that includes everyone? And what about after the service? I love to share fellowship, to hear how people are and what's happening in their lives. It's probably my one opportunity to speak to people in a week. But it's incredibly hard to have that conversation in a noisy room where everyone else is eagerly doing the same. Is there a quieter space where everyone who needs to, where, where anyone who needs to can go and talk? without the oral distraction. No church can meet all these needs, but it is good Christian living to be aware of others' needs and do what we can to make church buildings and services as accessible as possible. Have we at least thought that there may be needs and ways we could work around them and with them? Please don't assume. What is most important is to ask people what works best for them and be willing to do all you can towards that. But also, don't forget those who won't say anything, who don't want to make a fuss. Try and think what might be excluding somebody and ask what would help best. And it's important to remember that as some joyfully go back to meeting in church buildings, there will be those who can't access physical church at all. How can we continue to meet their need and not re-exclude those who have found during lockdown that they have access to so much? But maybe that's the subject of another webinar. Uh, thanks, Pam, for giving, me, giving us all that information and your viewpoint and the way that you feel about how people can help people like you or people with special needs or extra needs or needing support 
how we can help people uh, be a part of our church in a better and more involved way. So I just wanted to pick you up on what you said about the pews when you were saying that for you it was just a non-starter. And the number of times I've come across arguments and discussions in churches about whether they should leave the pews or not, and only recently uh, discussions about whether they should have accessible toilets because it would spoil the look of the church. And to me, it's why is anybody even discussing this? It's, it's not a discussion point. It's a, you do this for me, but clearly there are other people who feel differently. And I wondered when you come across attitudes like this, how it must feel for you, for people to think that there is a choice in the matter as to whether they become a more accessible and accepting and welcoming church. To be quite honest, it, it makes me feel unwanted. Um, mm. if, if you're not willing to do a relatively small thing to make it possible for me to come to church, um, am, I not, am I not important? Does it not matter if I'm not um, a part of your church? Um, and I guess the, the biggest danger of that is um, it, it's possible for people to read I don't matter to this church as I don't matter to God. Um, and it being a, reject, a rejection by the church is a rejection um, by God. People are frightened to ask. Um, some people who need help don't like being asked yeah. and yeah. others would prefer that one did because then they can get the help that they need. What's your take on that? Um, yeah, I mean, a few years ago, I decided if I didn't tell people what I needed, then I couldn't complain that they weren't giving it me. Mm -hmm. um, if I tell people what I need and they say no, um, then we all know where we stand. Um, and um, it, it's, it's important to not assume what people need um, mm -hmm. and to either offer them the wrong thing or not be giving them the right thing and what looks like what we need might not be exactly what we need so I, I think it's important um it's important for people to be willing to talk on both sides so that we can at least understand not everything's ever going to be possible because it's it's just not you know not everything in my house is perfect for me I just have yeah, to yeah. you know uh, do what you can um but at least if we're talking we we know what might be needed and in any future plans you know what might be important to take into account and as I also said different people might have different needs that conflict with each other so you know you, you've got to find that that balance but unless you talk to people you don't know what what their need is. If you can't see a disability then there isn't one. How, how yeah. Can a church, or is there anything a church can do about that, or is it really up to the person to be asking for help when we might not be able to see that there is an issue for them? Um, I think it's, it's important for there to be an awareness that people might be struggling in ways that you don't know. Um, and and yeah, not to make assumptions, but it's also maybe up to the person who has those disabilities to say something, however hard um, that might be. I think it would be that it would be just don't assume that you know what's happening in someone else's life. so much to Pam for sharing her story, some wonderful insights there um, and some pointers. And thank you to all of you um, who are putting links to resources in the chat. We will save that and make sure that all that information is sent out to you. Um, we're going to come now to Wayne Ashton, um, who's going to share something of his story with us. Thank you, Wayne, and welcome. Thank you ever so much. Thank you so much. And I'll, thank you for the stories we've heard. Can I say a hello to my lovely friends from my Barnsley circuit that I've spotted and I still miss you. Um, I'll be honest with you, I've never ever spoken uh, publicly like this about my disability. But when Carla did ring me, um, I said, can I make something very clear? 
I have a disability, but I am in no way disabled. And that's the way, as, as most said earlier, people choose to deal with their situations, which are pertinent to them and relevant to them. To them. And that's the way I've chosen to, to look at my story. I have a disability, but I'm not disabled. Uh, up to the 30 years of age, I was absolutely fine, fit, healthy. I was a swimmer, I did lots of things. Uh, we just had our first baby, our first little boy. Life was a bed of roses, it was, it was absolutely wonderful. And then on the 28th of February, I suffered a massive brain hemorrhage, a superachnoid hemorrhage, um, which robbed me totally of my left side. And I remember at one point, I'd been given 24 hours to live. So when my wife came to the Hallamshire, I said, look, I might not be here in the next 24 hours. Is there anything you want to ask me? She said, yep. Yeah. How do you put petrol in the car? And I immediately started to laugh. And I'm convinced to this day that that was the first stage in, in getting better, first stage in moving towards something positive. And I'm, I am blessed with a sense of humour. It's not everybody's sense of humour. I upset more people than I could imagine. But that's just the way I tend to deal with things. And as I said, I was 30 years old and it happened the day before my son's first birthday. So I always said I've got a lot to get better for. I, I survived 24 hours. In fact, I've now survived 32 years. So they did they get that prognosis a little bit wrong, didn't they? As I said, I lost the, lost the whole of my left side. Fortunately for me, I could still speak. Thank goodness for that. And um, I spent nine weeks in hospital and then a further 12 weeks of rehabilitation unit learning to walk again. I went in in a wheelchair and I walked out, albeit with a limp, which I still have. I have no use at all in my left arm and hand, although I still play the piano of a fashion. And I'm left with chronic pain uh, all down my left side. And, and chronic pain just means pain that's lasted a long time. And it varies. We also have to call it to the weather, to be honest. Um, and that, that's how it's left me. But I've seen the funny side of being in a wheelchair. I spent quite a bit of time in a wheelchair. And we've not got time now. But I could share lots of funny stories of that. I returned to work, um, believe it or not, after six months, being advised to have a year off. Uh, I'd just been promoted to deputy head teacher of a large primary school in Rotherham. Now, I must admit, the school and the, the area were fantastic. They really were. And my wonderful boss then got me a teaching assistant, an on-teaching assistant, in the days before we had them. So I had a lot of support, wonderful support, and we progressed uh, from then on. I did suffer for two years in a depression, and uh, within... A fortnight of getting a car and driving again, the depression disappeared. It creeps on occasionally, like everybody, but it disappeared. I realised it wasn't my disability that was depressing me. It was the fact that I'd lost my dependence. So the car did the trick. As I said, I've still no use in my left arm. I still have a lot of pain and I do walk with a limp. But we had another, another baby after that. And life is great, I I don't say retired from, from teaching. I had a career change 12 years ago when I came into the ministry and I'm now pastor of three wonderful churches in the Rotherham and Durham Valley Methodist Circuit. One thing at school I didn't want to mention, um, one thing that concerned me is how the kids would react, primary school, year six. And I can honestly say I've never heard anything behind my back. In fact, the rumour was that I walked like this. It's because of where I got shot in the war. I'm not sure which war that is, but I'm quite happy with that. The kids thought I were a bit of a war hero. So I, I went on with, along with that. As I say, I run three churches. Um, there's nothing really that I can't do because I've adapted so well. I must admit, I've done so well with, with my right hand. There's very, there's very little. And I always say to people, if I need help, I will ask. And to be honest, lots of people don't even notice. They're not looking for these things. And so, as I said at the beginning, I have a disability, but I don't consider myself disabled in many ways at all. Um, the job itself in church is good from my perspective because I can anticipate and see where disability needs will arise. And when I change circuits and change churches, I must admit, the superintendent minister came to see me and said, is there anything we can do in our church to make life easier for you? There wasn't, because I was fine, but the point is she asked. 
And I thought that was absolutely amazing that, you know, so we're prepared to change things. As I said, I've got three very different churches, accessibility wise, etc. But they're all, they're all wonderful. I go about the normal business. I work 30 hours a week and I do everything there, there is to be done in the church. And that's why I keep saying, um, I'm not, dis I don't class myself as disabled, although I have a disability, but that seems to affect other people more than me. And we have a laugh about things because people just don't realise till they'll pass me something and assume that I can manage to hold it or grab it with the left hand when you can't. But honestly, people have been great. They really have. And there's a text in the Bible that says, when I am weak, then I am strong. And I'm not going to go into preaching mode at all. When I am weak, then I am strong. And the strange thing is, in weakness, you do find a strength, a strength from your faith. So I've had great support from my family, friends, churches, but wonderful support from God. At first, I did expect total healing. I was convinced God would heal me and I would run about and skip and uh, swim and play all my instruments again. I realise now the healing is a different process altogether. I've been healed by what I can do in a different way. And I must admit, in, in the lockdown and going back to church, it's been exciting for me in my congregations to look again at how we can go back in a different way from this perspective. So life's great for me, to be honest, but I've had a great time. I learned to live with it, cope with it. You have your good days, you have your bad days, whether you're disabled or not, and you just go with the flow. It's the first time I've shared my story ever. So thanks for listening, and I look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Take care. God bless. Thank you so much, Wayne. Pleasure. What a joy. OK, so we've got plenty of time for our next breakout room. And we want to give you an opportunity just to think about what difference should hearing the stories from today um, make to our churches? So what difference should it make um, and what can perhaps we do? And you're going to have a good 10 minutes. Welcome back, everyone. I think most people are back. Um, so we hope you had uh, another good time in your breakout rooms and uh, good conversation. Uh, there's already been so much uh, really helpful and important uh, contributions to chat. So what we're going to do now is I'm just going to invite um, Pam and Mo to respond to some of the issues and questions that were raised in chat earlier. I would encourage you to continue to contribute to chat with questions and contributions that you have. Um, and we may have time for you to actually ask other questions as well in person. But we're just going to start with, uh, I'm going to invite Pam to respond to something that was in chat earlier. So over to you, Pam. Hello, everyone. It's nice to speak to you um, live. Um, just a couple of things that I saw scrolling through um, the chat. One was about prayers for healing. Um, healing is such a, a, a thorny issue. And... Um, whether people consider you need healing. Um, I've, I guess, been forced to think um, and write quite a lot around this. And my personal feeling is that I am healed just as I am um, in the very fact that I am able to um, live with how I am. Uh, to me, that that is healing and how God uses me in it. Um, and someone else mentioned about um, seeing some of the conditions that they had included in um, in what it, in, in dis or classified as disabilities. Um, I actually found the label of being disabled when I felt able to to claim it, I suppose, for myself as a really helpful and liberating label. Um, for a long time, I'd gone around with my various symptoms not diagnosed and to actually suddenly for it suddenly to click that um, they actually fitted into the category of disabled and I didn't have to just describe a whole chain of symptoms that I had but could just say I am disabled I actually found really liberating so you know if it works for you um, use it and embrace it if that's an encouragement <laughs> Thank you so much, Pam, and thank you for all that you shared with us today. And uh, lovely to have you here uh, live, as you say. Um, so thank you. Um, before we just go to Mo, can I just encourage anything that comes out has come out of your breakout room? Any of the you know 
feedback on on what difference uh, hearing these stories should make to our churches and what actions should be taken if you if you want to put any of those in chat then please feel free to do that um as we're listening to mo so over to you mo to address some of those issues from chat earlier thank you yeah i picked up um some of them someone asked about dementia and where that fits into the equality act dementia is usually a progressive condition and from the point it becomes a barrier to situations and places and engaging with people any sort of substantial effect then dementia becomes covered by the um, Equality Act. I think though it's not necessarily helpful just to consider when someone's covered by the Equality Act but when someone's got symptoms that might make attending church difficult, might make engaging difficult, that's really when we start to think okay they need a bit of support to be included um, and that's perhaps a more helpful way to think about it. Um, someone else asked how to engage with people with severe learning disabilities. I wasn't sure whether you meant as, as a group of people or as, a, as individuals in church. I would say generally engage with them as individuals because people with learning disabilities are going to have totally different ways of engaging between one person and another. Um, but the best thing to do is talk to them age appropriately um, you know, and, and include them as much as you can. And the people supporting people with a learning disability, if they've got someone supporting them, can help you with that and offer advice. But it's best to talk to the, the person. And there are a lot of groups in each city or town or wherever who will be working with people with learning disabilities or will have some ideas for you as to how you can advertise events and include people uh, or engage them in your church activities. Um, hopefully that's, that's a helpful thing to say there. Um, other people might want to chip in later about that. Um, also, there was a question asked about whether ignoring wheelchair users has changed over the years. Um, having grown up with my dad being a wheelchair user all his life, so I've, I've always known him as a wheelchair user and I don't think it's changed because um, people, uh, used to ignore my dad so we were hiring a car on holiday is one example I, and the person started asking me questions about the car and I'm like I'm 12 ask my dad he's the driver um you know <laughs> don't look at me I know nothing um but also now as I said before I think my son tends to get the questions asked of him when we're out together um just as I used to do and I it takes all I'm worth to explain to them that he's not going to talk to you because you're a stranger and he selectively meets so he doesn't talk to strangers at all and because um, they're not listening to me that's quite a difficult thing to get across sometimes and I have been known to have a bit of fun with the fact that I'm fairly invisible in some places um, but I don't think it's changed and it's even more confusing when me and my dad turn up together as wheelchair users uh, especially when we collected my mum from hospital after a hip operation and the doctor said, um, so who's taking you home? And uh, we went, we are. <laughs> and the look of surprise on his face was, was quite something. It's like, But if anyone knows how to deal with this, we do. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think that's changed, sadly. I, I hope that it will. Thank you so much, Mo, for your, the wisdom you've shared with us uh, and the humour, indeed, that you shared with us this afternoon. So thank you. Can I just check, Wayne, there's nothing you want. Is there anything you'd like to say at this moment? No, no. So we just have a couple of moments. If anyone has any questions for our uh, contributors this afternoon, you probably need to raise your hand in the reactions. Use the raise hand function or unmute yourself and speak. I can't see all of you. So. Um, if anyone has a question for any of our contributors, we just have a couple of moments for that. If anyone wants to be brave and uh, raise their hand and ask a question or unmute themselves and ask a question. Could I ask the question or a question, please, Graham? Uh, yes, please do. David here. <coughs> David, yes. I, I've been... Um, so encouraged by this i'm so glad i joined in and i wholeheartedly want to be able to um, commend you and uh, circulate the the video if the recording is going to be available um possibly um 
to listen to Mo saying that she was a preacher and then considering uh, candidating and uh, others sharing Wayne's story and Pam's story. We, we need more people to be uh, more vocal and to be seen more regularly in our churches, even with the difficulties, and to not challenge, but to robustly encourage preachers and leaders of worship to encourage people with a disability or a condition to actually be included in the rotors for speaking, Bible reading, uh, whatever it might be, because people often say, oh no, she can't do that, he can't do that, that to get the microphone to the spaces. We, we, need, we need you to be uh, robustly speaking, please, and uh, whatever process and mechanisms that we, we can help, you know, people like me and other allies, please, um, please, 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 uh, don't be quiet, you know, do not be quiet, please, we need you. Thank you. Thank you, David, thank you for that. Um, anyone else with one, one final question we could take, if anyone has one, before I pass back to Rachel, but... Can I, can I speak? Can I ask or make a suggestion? Yes, please do. Um, I found what um, I'm so, so helpful because she gave us some practical issues that, you know, most of us perhaps don't think about. Um, is there a possibility that we could have, you know, a hair presentation so we can share it, you know, be it in our, our churches or in our communities? Because I, I found what she said very, very helpful. I mean, a simple thing like, is the font big enough? You know, those kind of practical things that, you know, people don't think about. So I'm just um, asking whether that is, uh, is a possibility. Okay, thank you, Eve, for your question. Um, maybe this would be a helpful point for me then to pass back to Rachel, who can, who can answer to that question in terms of the more general ways in which we can respond um, following this webinar. Is that okay, Rachel, with a hand to you? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Graham. And um, just first of all, a massive thank you to, to Pam and to Mo and to Wayne. Um, we've been doing these webinars now all through the pandemic, but this series of EDI webinars has just been so amazing and moving and um, we're so grateful we couldn't do it without you we are not experts in all things so it's just wonderful to have your stories and your wisdom um, and just that as you say the humor that you've shared and the practical tips that you've shared have just been really really helpful so um Catherine who you can't see but we love her she's behind the scenes and does all our technology for us and we will save the chat and we will put it into a format and um, where all the links are together to all of the resources um, but I would also just like to say there are some really um, moving stories that people have shared in the chat um, I would like to be able to send those out as well because um, I don't expect everybody's had the opportunity to read everything so if anybody doesn't want their little story um, shared um, from chat going out to the participants it will only go to participants then please do just let us know and the only other thing I'd like to highlight, Carla mentioned it at the beginning, is the EDI toolkit on the Methodist Church website. If you go to the search engine of the Methodist Church website and put in EDI toolkit, um, you will be taken there. Um, things you know, as Mo has said at the very beginning, even now, some of the language isn't as up to date as it might be, but there are some really helpful activities and information and case studies um, that you can engage with on all sorts of different EDI topics that might be helpful for your churches. So, uh, oh, thank you. Um, that's in the chat as well now. So um, it's a really good source of information. And as previously, um, these EDI webinars, we've been building on what's gone before and we've been asking you to interact with us and let us know um, what you'd like to do next. So the next EDI webinar is on uh, Tuesday, the 22nd of June from 1 to 2.30. And at the moment we are without agenda. So it's a wonderful thing to be able to say. Um, so when you get your feedback um, um, link through from us, 
um, please do let us know what it would be helpful to address next. We've spoken a bit about sexuality and people's stories surrounding um, their experiences. We've touched today on disability. Um, is there another area of EDI that you would like to have a look at and explore at the next webinar? Do please let us know um, and we will do our best. We will find excellent people uh, to invite that can come and share with us um, some of their stories. So just again, a big thank you to everybody who's been involved today, but especially our story sharers and our speakers. It's been a joy. Um, and thank you to my colleagues um, for helping and supporting us um, in the work today. We, if there's anything else that people want to put in the chat as you leave, then please do. We'll be hanging on for a little bit longer. Um, but I'm just going to close with the prayer, the closing prayer from the EDI toolkit um, on disability. So let's pray. Jesus, by your wounded feet, direct our path aright. Jesus, by your nailed hands, move us to deeds of love. Jesus, by your pierced side, cleanse our desires. Jesus, by your broken heart, knit ours to yours. Amen. Thank you all and go well until the next time. We will be sending details of the next webinar out as well. So please do sign up if you're able.